Thank you very much. Um, and uh, my thanks uh, to Joe for inviting me today. Uh, uh, what I'm going to talk about is, in many ways, um, confidence and uh, fleshes out points that David made in the initial uh, lecture. And again, com um, compliments, uh, particularly the final point made in Elizabeth's lecture about um, uh, the um, uh, Navy's impressive record in terms of innovation before and during the, uh, the war. And, and uh, uh, if any of you are interested, there's a book that came out about a year ago published by the National Museum of the Royal Navy, um, simply called uh, The Royal Navy in the First World War. And the chats are in that on um, the Royal Navy and innovation is terrific. It, it, it's very succinct uh, and at the same time very illuminating and I, I recommend it to you. I mean, two, two trivial points coming out of David's lecture. Um, this might come in handy in a pub quiz, you don't know, but um, <laughs> the, uh, the Handley Page Bomber, um, that's the aircraft in which the first in-flight movie was shown. <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing is, uh, yeah, I wrote a book on Mountbatten, and uh, Patrick Blackett features quite prominently. He and, he and Mountbatten were great friends, and they had a common interest in India. Um, and, um, uh, and they went to Cambridge at the same time, in 1919. But of course, um, Dickey went back to the Royal Navy, and Blackett carried on in the, the Mathematic uh, Tripos. And, and Mamba could never understand that. He could never understand, despite the fact that Blackett went on to uh, great distinction, Nobel Prize, etc. Um, Mamba was always telling the greatest mistake he ever made. So, <laughs> stay in Cambridge in 1919, and we'll not go back to sea. So let me start with the overall picture. Uh, and it commence with um, uh, snapshots in the sky, if you like, from the first Christmas day and from the last Christmas day of, uh, of the First World War. So snapshot number one on the 25th of December 1914, um, as elements of the British Expeditionary Force enjoyed a brief respite from the fighting, Royal Naval Air Service mounted um, what was a truly <coughs> audacious raid on the Zeppelin sheds at Cuxhaven. Uh, and if any of you have, um, uh, have heard uh, uh, lectures from, from Dartmouth talking about the Great Wall, this is where they always start, right, with the, with the attack uh, on Cuxhaven. Now, my second snapshot is in northern France um, on Christmas Day, on 25th of December 1917. Uh, on that day, 40 squadrons McManock and 56 squadrons Sir uh, James McCudden insisted that their flights take the battle to the enemy. The same as just on any other day on the Western Front. Aces and engineers, both men needed every opportunity to fine-tune the power unit and the armament of the SE-5A. The key to the Royal Flying Corps, 1st of April, one half of the Royal Air Force, securing a definitive aeronautical advantage over the enemy. Ultimately, um, as we've seen already this morning from, from David's comments, the British triumphed in the Great Air War of 1917-18 because of quantity and quality. So let's consider first quantity. The growth of the British uh, aircraft industry in the course of the First World War um, is truly remarkable. Um, uh, here, here is a place where the hyperbole uh, is suitably appropriate. And it's remarkable not least in the dramatic acceleration of production across the final two years of the conflict. The monthly output um, at the start of 1917 was still only 122 machines. And yet by the time of the armistice in November 1918, the workforce stood at around 300,000, and that monthly output was a remarkable 2,688. And the RAF lost uh, no less than 7,000 aircraft in the last 10 months of the war. And yet, operational squadrons on the front line um, enjoyed a steady stream of replacements. The ground crews, observing ground crews, found the supply of spares equally reliable. Frontline serviceability on the Western Front in the autumn of 1918 stood above 85%. 
So when you've got production on this scale, it powerfully uh, demonstrates Britain's belated embrace of industrial reward, with large, suitably skilled design teams facilitating this vital balance of quantity and quality. Uh, and as for, as for the quality, it, well, compare a fighter aircraft or a scout, such as the SE-5A, which is being flown that Christmas Day morning in 1917 at a cruising height, maximum cruising height of 20,000 feet, with the mechanically simple machines that were taken to France in the late summer of 1914. And I'm very careful with my words here for reasons which you will see in a moment. And it's not just because we've already seen a shot of the VU-2C. The rate of change of av in aviation across the course of the First World War was, as, as, as many of you know that now, no, determined by a technological imperative, with one side gaining a huge and deeply destructive advantage until the other caught up and then secured his own advantage as a consequence of fresh innovation and so on. So yes, poorly performing machines did somehow survive the prototype stage and go into production, feeding that sort of like, voracious appetite for combat aircraft. But despite these death traps reaching the front line, uh, and there are not, obviously there are parallels to this in the Second World War, there's, if you like, a, sort of a, a Darwinian process of procurement that prioritised the production of planes tested in the air war that was taking place, not just on the Western Front, of course, but um, uh, on the Italian Front and in the Middle East. This was in every sense <coughs> a global conflagration, with Royal Flying Corps and Royal Naval Air Service squadrons deployed en masse, as I say, far beyond the Western Front. An aircraft like the Sopwith Camel, like the SE-5A, by 1918 would follow, certainly by the summer of 1918, were proven killing machines, especially when they were flown by pilots and technicians like Mick Manick or James McCudden. And yet, as I've already hinted, this familiar story of the war in the air warrants qualification. If you go back and remember that first defiant demonstration of maritime air power that was simultaneous with the Christmas truce of 1914. The obvious question is, if aircraft were so primitive at the start of the war, then how are the Admiralty's aviators capable of launching an air attack <clears throat> on the far side of the North Sea? And of course the reality was that not all aircraft were as unsophisticated as those which are usually highlighted in any um, uh, popular history that talks about the Royal Flying Corps crossing the channel at the onset of the war. I'm thinking, for example, of... Um, uh, Jeremy Paxman last year in his was Jeremy Paxman wasn't it, in his uh, uh, series on the First World War. Seven of the RNAS aircraft that attempted to bomb the Cooks Harbour base were built by Short Brothers. These seaplanes' relative sophistication was the result of what we've already seen signalled this morning: this close working relationship with the Admiralty. Um, uh, it was a, a a bilateral relationship between the Admiralty's Air Department under Murray Souter um, and uh, Shorts in North Kent, which dated from 1912 through and into the First World War. Pre-war, the British Army never established parallel partnerships with individual manufacturers. Uh, it relied heavily, again, as we've seen, upon the publicly funded uh, Royal Aircraft Factory at Farnborough. Uh, the factory um, as it was known, uh, would flourish in wartime, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, uh, what took place there. Um, and yet, and yet, it always had, um, had an uneasy, perhaps an even unhappy relationship with individual manufacturers, with people like Fairview or Henry Page. And Farmer's critics pointed to the type of aircraft that were flown by Royal Navy pilots as evidence that entrepreneurial aviation pioneers like the Shaw Brothers or like Tommy Sopwith uh, were more innovative designers than their state-sponsored counterparts. So what does this um, important rejoinder to our grand narrative 
concerning British combat aircraft in the First World War. What does it have to do with physicists? Well, another familiar element when telling the story of British aviation across the First World War is, as we've seen this morning, uh, the portrayal of applied and theoretical scientists making a significant contribution to research and development between 1914-18, and then returning to the laboratory, returning to the lecture field. And so, within our, within our, 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 our um, sort of familiar picture of the war, uh, physicists of various varieties and their colleagues in pure applied maths are mobilised in order to aid the war effort, and collectively they act as a catalyst. In other words, their individual or joint experimentation makes um, a crucial contribution to wartime aeronautics, a revolution in aircraft design, but the assumption is that it's unique to the four years of the conflict. And that, furthermore, the same phenomenon will occur again on an even vaster scale uh, a quarter of a century later. Well, I want to suggest, and again building on what uh, uh, David was saying in the first lecture, that um, while clearly plentiful examples exist of physicists who made a significant contribution for the duration of the war, there was also a strong thread of continuity. <clears throat> that the pioneering generation of designers were from the outset keen to utilise university educated scientists and mathematicians not least because their own training as engineers had left them heavily indebted to physics and physicists. The Tyro industrialists like uh, Geoffrey de Havilland, Fred Handley Page and Richard Ferry were as comfortable um, on the shop floor as in the boardroom and as adept at reading a spreadsheet as a blueprint, but that they were a unique generation of technicians. They were driven by enterprise, but by dint of their youth and their education, they had a distinctly modern attitude um, concerning the contribution of science to making machines and to making money. And that this respect was reciprocated by graduates of Cambridge, Imperial, Manchester, etc. Um, uh, a number of whom were encouraged by practical minded tutors to embrace and enter what I suppose, later in the interwar period we call the Sunrise Industries. So, uh, Obviously, David, uh, in books like Warfare, Warfare State, before that, in, in critiquing uh, uh, Corelli Barnett, um, has portrayed that um, uh, an industrial, like an industrial academy uh, interrelationship is very different from that that's portrayed by declinists like Corelli Barnett. Remember that Barnett, um, going all the way back to uh, the audit of war. Barnett downgraded the calibre of science and technology tuition in Britain, um, comparing it unfavourably with comparable centres of excellence in the Wilhelm Line. And as we'll see, um, British universities' curricula of both pure and applied science actually contrasted very favourably with the narrow focus upon engineering that was maintained in most of Germany's technical high schools. And that really leads me on to talking about aircraft design rooted in the firm theoretical understanding. The fascination with heavier than air man flight, of course, dates all the way back to Icarus. Uh, the Wright Brothers' success at Kitty Hawk on 17th of December 1903 has a long and complex backstory. On both sides of the Atlantic and of the Channel, the science of aeronautics was formalised and institutionalised in the second half of the 19th century, with global telecommunications facilitating a fertile exchange of ideas. It's not surprising that engineers rooted their experimental designs in hard science. Sorry for the repeated use of science. I warned you this morning. Um, for people that I'm talking about, the solid grounding in physics and method mechanics was a prerequisite. And furthermore, um, these engineers were adamant that their successors inherited the same intellectual equipment. So the autodidact Horace Shaw, mathematical genius and co-founder Shaw Brothers, insisted that the first cohort of 
Navy pilots who trained on Sheppey, um, trained by his company, um, that they should fly during the day and then at night that they should be subject to intensive study. Um, and uh, you, can, you, can, you can still see a Horace Short's programme at Q today. Uh, and if you came out of that, you know, pi famous pilots like Charles Sampson, then really you had a branding somewhat equivalent to the bright, that of the brightest physics graduate. Um, and the founding fathers of the fleet are were unique in their impressive scientific credentials because several wartime uh, recruits to the uh, Royal Navy Air Service had studied engineering at Cambridge under the supervision of Virgil Hopkinson. And Professor Hopkinson made sure that uh, his students in mechanical sciences um, had um, a solid grounding in technical design and assembly. And he encouraged undergraduates to uh, spend their summer vacations at, at focal points for Edwardian aviation, like the Isle of Shep. And indeed, um, three of the pivotal figures in the, in the history of ferry aviation um, were Cambridge undergraduates who met Richard Ferry at East Church in the years before the First World War. Um, and that similar insistence on practical experimentation rooted in rigorous calculation and computation was the norm at Manchester University, again uh, mentioned already this morning on more than one occasion. And here we have mathematicians and physicists mounting ambitious programs of experimental aerodynamics. Um, and a preoccupation in Manchester with wing design later extended to hydrodynamics. Uh, and you see Manchester and the factory at Farnborough jointly modelling optimum uh, seaplane performance at takeoff and landing, and then sharing their calculations with uh, Horace Short down on the, uh, on the medley. Manchester, arguably Manchester's most distinguished physicist, aside from Rutherford, was uh, Ernest uh, Petterville, and he combined a chair in engineering with a pilot certificate. Uh, and uh, uh, a combination of uh, his uh, academic credentials uh, and being able to fly was a, um, qualified him particularly for later in his career, as we will see, when he worked at the National Physical Laboratory, headed the National Physical Laboratory, and when he oversaw the installation uh, of the MTL's first wind tunnels. So clearly, the aviation industry in Britain on the eve of the Great War was. Um, on the one hand, uh, almost a sort of, I guess if I say a sort of hot house, if you like, for, um, uh, for, 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 for de design and development of aircraft. But on the other hand, it was clearly handicapped by uh, a sort of mutual suspicion between the public and the private sectors. But as I say, um, there was communication, a surprising degree of communication, uh, a communication between uh, the academics, the engineer entrepreneurs, the service ministries, um, and these fledgling state funded institutions, the, the Royal Aircraft Factory and the National Physical Laboratory in Middlesex. Um, and there's already been uh, signaled this morning that, and, and, and indicated by me, this was not an easy relationship. But clearly the Admiralty, when, especially when Churchill his, uh, his first lord of the Admiralty and Prince Louis Battenberg, his first sea lord, the Admiralty is crucial in terms of fostering cooperation. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Admiralty, the Royal Navy, um, ensured that contrary to popular assumption, the British aircraft industry um, could boast a modest infrastructure at the start of the war. Um, Immediately, I need to qualify. Almost everything I say this morning about the aircraft industry um, needs to be, um, uh, you know, I need to hedge my bets, if you like. Um, why does it need qualification? Because we're talking about building aircraft, not building engines. Uh, and the British aero industry in 1914 scarcely existed. And the lack of reliable, high performance power unit, uh, really, that that problem made all the way as a major break on the British war effort all the way through until the early months of 1918. Now these engineer entrepreneurs were young men 
reaching a creative peak at the very moment that aeronautics is, uh, if you like, accelerating away from the rudimentary technology that had got the right brothers off the ground in December 1903. Inspired by Horace Shaw and his brothers, the most talented of this first generation of aircraft manufacturers, people like Tommy Sockle, like A.V. Rowe. First of all, they meet the unprecedented demands of industrial war, and then they survive um, the rude shock like of, of peacetime retrenchment. They're products of a late Victorian middle class that places a premium on manufacturing and on commerce. They're mechanical polymaths. They're stripping down and rebuilding cars and motorcycles, and then they're moving on to uh, uh, balloons and aeroplanes. Uh, they're resisting the narrow specialism of the varsity graduates that they're increasingly coming into contact with. Uh, and the likes of Geoffrey de Havilland or Richard Ferry um, look to the technical colleges and the polytechnics for thorough grounding in all aspects of applied science and uh, mathematics, not least mechanics. Um, they're comfortable with physics. Um, they're unfazed by scientific theory. Um, and yet, by dint of training and direct experience, they're um, highly practical. Whether uh, uh, at the drawing board or on the shop floor, um, they're, they're quintessential problems on this. Uh, they're as, a, as adept with a torque wrench as they are with a slide wheel. They understood the dynamics of flight, but they saw ab initio research as an inductive and applied process requiring hard graph uh, on the runway in the hangar. Um, the quality of their education ensured um, an equal partnership when they're working with graduate scientists and mathematicians. Um, a number of them, for example, uh, including, uh, including Ferry, um, trained under Sylvanus Thompson, distinguished physicist, uh, who was professor of physics at Bristol uh, um, at uh, Finsbury Technical College. Um, and if you take Ferry, Ferry is uh, an intuitive stress man. He shared the excess weight from a machine by systematic identification of key, key stress points, um, uh, which in turn ensured the precise deployment of struts and wires to optimal effect. Um, most stress men on the eve of the First World War boasted maths degrees. So we, we have mentioned already this morning Edward Buss at, at, at Farnborough um, and his work on uh, inherent stability which, as David said, was, was, was cut short by a fatal air crash. And he is a classic example of a stress man with a degree. Fair is a classic example of a stress man who has, um, you know, uh, through part-time study, acquired the same um, theoretical um, uh, understanding, but complemented by hard work in the hands. Um, Fairy's adeptness in the complex process of countering and minimising stress depended very heavily on the public cal pu published calculations of Harris Boone, who was another hands-on graduate in the mechanical uh, sciences tripos at Cambridge. And Boone was at that time engaged in theoretical work on stress at the National Physical Laboratory. And Busk and Boone, in their way, they do signal a future. Uh, ultimately, a largely graduate industry where the complexity of the technology demands specialist expertise that's available only within select institutions. So what we see by the 1920s um, is Imperial College's expansion, um, partly at the expense of Finsbury Technical College. But what's striking is how long it takes for this sort of new... Um, uh, new direction, new composition to come up, to come about. That the first generation of aircraft manufacturers are still key players at the start of the jet age and into the nineteen into the nineteen fifties. But nevertheless, graduate scientists and many of them physicists um, were contributing, as we've seen, to aircraft design and manufacture before August 1914. Most of them, a large number of them, will continue to do so after the war, assuming that their company survives air ministry um, 
uh, cutbacks, that there is a continuity, um, and that it is sending out a signal as to how, taking the longer view, the industry will develop. Um, and what one can't ignore is that this influx of scientists in the course of the First World War, in the course of the Second World War, clearly is important in, term, importance of, in terms of signaling this belated reconstruction of the British Air and Space Industry in the final third of the 20th century. So focusing uh, specifically on physicists, on physicists who do go to war for the course of the, uh, the, uh, the, for the duration of the conflict. Um, well, before focusing upon Farmer, again, it's important to, to acknowledge the contribution of the National Physics Laboratory. Um, uh, it was, a, an, as, as David has said, it was a natural home for physicists throughout the war. Um, and it's standing um, as a centre of scholarship rested very much on the outstanding leadership that was demonstrated by uh, its first two directors, both of whom were passionate about the science of flight. The founding father of the MPL was Sir Richard Glazebrook. He'd established his reputation at the Cambridge Laboratory. He was a pillar of the scientific establishment even before he took up his post in 1899? Anyway, I think round right about, right about the turn of the century. Um, and before and after he, he launches the laboratory, um, he's got just about every honour, just about every appointment that's open to him. You know. If he was around today, he'd probably be, I don't know, um, it wouldn't be Van Morrison, it'd be Sir Richard Glazebrook who'd be leading the eight o'clock news, you know, Queen's birthday on this. Um, Glazebrook stepped down in 1919, briefly returned to Cambridge and then established uh, aeronautics as a, a flagship department at, uh, at Imperial. Mentioned already Sir Ernest Petterbell, his experimental <coughs> work on, on wings at Manchester. Um, his, his, his initial connection with the laboratory is that he becomes a board member in 1911. Four years later, he's appointed chairman of the Aerodynamics Advisory Committee. Um, and remember that the, uh, the pilot certificate, even sceptical manufacturers like Ferry um, are impressed by the fact that, uh, that he is an experienced pilot. He's got a presence in Whitehall, he's a player, and in September 1919, he's the Air Ministry's natural candidate to succeed Glazebrook. And across the interwar period, Petterville modernised the National Physical Laboratory site in South London, at the same time, um, consolidating its, its, its reputation for fostering both uh, blue skies and applied research. For example, I think I might say that a lot of what's and what's um, early work on radar takes place at the National Physical Laboratory. Um, uh, during the war itself, it uh, attracts uh, bright young men, sadly, as far as I'm aware, no bright young women, um, uh, and it quickly attracts this credibility within the science, uh, scientific community. Um, and I think it's important because um, temporary recruits, wartime acquaintance with the establishment, um, certainly, as I say, boosted it, its standing, its reputation. And yet, I think it's probably true to say that in terms of the popular consciousness, popular awareness, it's, the, the, the National Physical Laboratories never um, enjoy the same high profile uh, as the Royal Aircraft Establishment, which is what the, uh, the factory was known as from 1918. Um, not that um, the MPL and, uh, I see Ray smiling, recognising uh, uh, David Pinson, not that the, the, the MPL and Farnborough worked in isolation from each other. So, for example, uh, David Pinson, a Cambridge mathematician, travelling companion of Wittgenstein, um, a dedicatee of the, the Tractatus, um, he spent the second half of the war at the National Physical Laboratory, but most of his research was conducted uh, at Farnborough. Um, his test flights above North Hampshire become ever more hazardous, um, and uh, finally he was killed on the uh, 8th of sorry, what's that? What's that? Um, finally he was killed on the uh, 8th of May 19, 1918. Now, Pinson was quite a late recruit. Um, the majority of the uh, uh, mathematicians and the scientists who were based at the National Physical Laboratory in the Royal Aircraft Factory were recruited in the spring of 1915. Um, and because Glazebrook had a standing within the Royal Society of Physics Institute, etc., and to some extent, he had encyclopedic knowledge of both established and up and coming talent. So he could cherry pick. 
Um, and in the course of the war, um, future policymakers like uh, like Henry Tillard, like Frederick Lindemann, future Lord Chirwell, um <laughs> consolidated their reputation by, by by working at the NPL and especially working uh, at uh, at Palmer. Um, they're, they're, they're prime examples. They're probably the best known examples of uh, physicists who are adept at addressing this. Uh, this technological imperative of meeting the challenge that the enemy is throwing down. Um, uh, and this was evident from the speed with which uh, Lindemann and his colleagues gained their pilot certificates uh, once civilians at the factory were granted permission to fly in August 1916. Uh, Lindemann and Tizard survived their tenure as test pilots, and as of course everyone here probably knows, they kept both men ultimately become rival power brokers in the course of the Second World War. Um, until August 1914, Lindemann um, had been researching ultra low temperatures at the University of Berlin when he wasn't playing tennis with the Kaiser at Potsdam. And if anyone can ever, ex if anyone can explain to me how the Kaiser 100 played tennis, I'd love to know. Know. There's a historian from the Great Dilemmas for me, that and how Halifax was run um, and to shoot. Um, after the, but enough of that. Um, after the war, of course, Lindemann secures the chair at Oxford. He heads the Clarendon Laboratory. That's largely on the recommendation of Tizard, uh, who, um, as we say today, beat up Lindemann's theoretical solution to the problem of aircraft spin. Um, Lindemann's post war career confirmed that he wasn't in the front rank of nuclear physicists, whereas someone uh, who certainly was has already been mentioned this morning, and that was uh, Mosley. Who, uh, who died at the, uh, uh, at the Dardanelles. Um, uh, and I'm acutely aware of my, of my ignorance about Mosley, and tell me if I'm getting this wrong, but basically his work on the atomic number of elements uh, in his own quiet way revolutionized chemistry. Well, now the fact that no authority intervened to stop Henry Mosley joining the army demonstrates how early in the conflict the urgent need to expand munitions production so chemists and not physicists prioritise as vital to the war. In fact, this, is, this contributes to the myth that, that um, uh, was, was addressed in the, first, uh, in the first lecture of the First World War being seen as a, uh, as a chemist war as opposed to the Second World War as a physics war. Um, uh, Tizard um, had... Uh, uh, similarly volunteered uh, at the start of the war, but in June 1915 he was transferred to the Royal Flying Corps. I think he was a gunner. Uh, so. He was transferred to the Royal Flying Corps uh, as an experimental uh, um, equipment officer, and his original remit was to um, improve the quality of the bomb site, standard bomb site. Um, uh, and again, uh, once qualified to uh, to fly, Tizard becomes a test pilot. Uh, in 1917, Bertram Hopkinson uh, seconded now from Cambridge to Whitehall to mastermind aeronautic research and made Tizard <coughs> chief scientific officer at the newly established experimental uh, station at Marklesham, uh, Suffolk. Tizard led by example, uh, not least when, when, when monitoring aircraft performance in hazardous conditions. Um, and Markleshaw was extraordinarily successful in forging a harmonious team of, of civilian civil servants and military, uh, and military personnel. And on a back of that, that, they joined Hopkinson at the Air Ministry in 1918. And then later in the year, Hopkinson died in an air crash, and Tizard took over as controller of uh, research and development. And really, that's the point at which his, his career really takes off. Um, as for Lindemann, Lindemann's um, exploits at Farnborough, uh, most famously his sort of systematic spinning of, of notoriously un unstable aircraft, that it, you know, was clearly made his name. On the other hand, um, probably those exploits have been uh, have been uh, have been exaggerated to a degree. Nevertheless, uh, Lindemann, I suppose, the German German foe, if you like, um, his reports on auto and rotation were invaluable, and critically, they were very, very speedily transmitted to manufacturers like the Shaw Brothers, like Sopwith, like Richard Ferry. Um, but what we see here is this, kind of, by the way, do you know who's, <coughs> who's, um, who's with Lindemann in the photo? Sure. I thought you were. 
Um, um, this, uh, this rapid transmission and exchange of information um, um, contrasts sharply with much more relaxed attitudes before the war um, uh, regarding knowledge transfer. Um, in peacetime, it was a fairly haphazard affair. Um, but long before the establishment of the Air Ministry in 1918, both the Admiralty and the War Office ensured a systematic passage of technical data from the research establishments to the manufacturers. And similarly, the plane makers and the frontline squadrons on the Western Front were encouraged to provide a reciprocal feedback. Um, for example, the SE-5A would not have become such a formidable piece of kit if it hadn't been for um, uh, collective dissatisfaction with the original mark, uh, whether that be at home or critically on, uh, on the front line, and, and, and this triggered urgent remedial action in late 1917. Um, and well before the war, senior service personnel such as the Royal Flying Corps, David Henderson and Frederick Sykes, or the uh, Royal Naval Air Services, Murray Souter, they had, a, as, as we've seen, um, a healthy respect for the Balkans. Um, uh, and Sir Hugh Trenchard, um, the inaugural chief of staff, the chief of the air staff, um, was more than happy to receive trenchant criticism when inspecting squadrons in France and Belgium, from which he then prioritised the briefing of relevant bodies back home. So what can we say by way of, by way of conclusion? Well, um, aeronautics was a, a uniquely 20th century science. And this sort of exciting new technology bore witness to that fact. The RAF's very public respect for its engineers was a key element in projecting the fledgling service as an excitingly modern phenomenon. Unsurprisingly, most of these engineers had a firm grounding in physics and mechanics, or were by dint of academic qualification, physicists. Physicists per se were mobilised from 1915 to consolidate and expand an already vibrant programme of testing and experimentation, primarily at Farber and at the National Physical, Physical Laboratory. And yet, within uh, this embryonic aircraft industry, there were already experts in aerodynamics and hydrodynamics for whom physics had constituted a major component of their degree. Designers <coughs> without degrees in natural or mechanical sciences had invariably studied physics and mathematics at an advanced level, courtesy of well-qualified staff like Sylvanus Thompson uh, at technical colleges like Finsbury and Crystal Palace. Their engineering skills were firmly rooted in scientific principle and they could more than hold their own with colleagues who boasted a more traditional academic background. Unique among these um, pioneers of British aviation uh, were the proto-industrials, the engineer entrepreneurs who founded those companies which across the 20th century would become household names, like the Hatman, like Taylor. Other than a keen sense of enterprise, common to all of them was a talent for mathematics. As their personal and their company papers uh, confirm, individuals like Geoffrey de Havilland like Richard Ferry, were brilliant at translating theory into practice. And having been educated by fellows of the Royal Society like Thompson, they maintained this healthy respect for hard science. What the design and development of combat aircraft in the First World War demonstrates is that the contribution of physicists per se was important but not critical. But the contribution of physics as a multifaceted discipline was absolutely crucial um, and to the critical credit of all involved from the boardroom down to the shop floor was seen to be so. Thank you very much. Um, Adrian, thank you very much. It's really interesting. Um, you didn't say much about the role that aircraft played in the military strategies adopted in, in the war. And one, I mean, I know nothing about it, but one obvious strategy might have been to bomb German trenches. Why was there so little of that, and why did they spend, why was there so little emphasis on developing the capacity to do that? Yeah, that's a good question, because, uh, again, as, 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 as 
was from that first lecture, an enormous amount uh, was invested in strategic bombing. First of all, targeting the Ruhr and now mm -hmm. targeting, targeting Berlin. But, um, uh, and, well, partly because uh, despite the you know, work on bomb science by Tim and all the rest of it, the, um, the, the, the technology to, um, uh, uh, to get that sort of pinpoint bombing was, um, was really, really true, and with leaving a very real danger of um, perhaps bombing on the other side of no man's land uh, in your own front in your own front line. Right, so but you might have thought they'd say, well, yeah, okay, here's a problem, now you physicists and scientists solve yeah, this problem. Yeah, that's good. Well, um, well they, instead, because of course, for so long the, the emphasis is on offensive, uh, they, they changed that focus to interdiction. Um, of course, because you don't, the, the, the problem with that was because um, uh, on the Western Front, uh, until late on into the war, um, you don't get the breakout, then the potential for interdiction, other than uh, the disrupting supplies, was, was, was limited. But then, come, come the, uh, the, uh, uh, the late spring, and summer, and then the autumn of 1918, it all comes together because, of course, um, uh, the uh, uh, one of the key factors in the advance of the uh, expeditionary force once uh, post Amiens you know, goes on there on the attack uh, is to exploit the uh, by now Royal Air Force's capability in terms of interdiction. So, yeah, they didn't. They, it's a good point. You know, why didn't they focus more on? Um, uh, on specific trench bombardment. As I said, the risk element is really important there. But what they did do was, was, was identify interdiction. As a, and the other thing, sorry, just a minute, just to say, of course, um, uh, with regards to trenches, the key role that they had from the start of the war was in terms of, was in terms of reconnaissance. So that if they weren't capable of bombarding trenches, then they would look to the artillery to do that instead, using the information. That they had. Okay, thank you. Can I ask you a question? You, you and the other speakers, you talk very eloquently about the very close links between the military and scientists, physicists, chemists, and industry. And what, apart from Paul Day, what about the government? How much scientific knowledge was there in the government? That's a, that, that's a very good part. I, I, ironically, in, a, in, in a, a conference almost exactly a year ago in Portsmouth on the Royal Navy in, uh, uh, in 19... Uh, uh, I, I, I raise it, 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 exactly the same point. Um, uh, that if you looked at Asquith's cabinet, they were incredibly learned. They probably got more degrees than any cabinet apart from Harold Wilson's in 1964. But in terms of um, uh, scientific training, or in terms of, uh, I mean, Hulk Day won't have that example, but in terms of like, being suitably enlightened, they go out and find out these things. The answer is. So that's a myth that is true. I mean, that's what's always said about the government at that time, but it used yeah. to have it, yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, okay. well, you mentioned at some point about the idea of these guys sort of tinkers as sort of metal bashing. And I'm not, not to be disparaging, but right? that's what they're doing, they're very practical with this knowledge of calculation of physics and mechanics. Do any of them come through the sort of the old traditional industries? Like, say, for example, I guess shipbuilding, railway works. Are they coming through these old technologies, or is this a completely separate? They're, just, they're outside of that premium apprenticeship system, and they're doing something completely yeah, different. Yeah, they're outside of it mostly. Not all of them, but mo mo I mean, uh, where, where they're associated with companies that already exist, like Bristol, then they are, they are coming from, 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 from that traditional background. Building trams and trains and things like that. But the, 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 I want to come back, by the way, to qualify what I just said to you. <laughs> um, um, but um, uh, the, 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 the people who become the key players, um, on the whole, they're, they're coming from, uh, from um, a different background. Mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, you, I can't emphasize enough. The, the, the importance of the fact that they're very good at maths, so that it's a transferable skill, so that they might find themselves working in commerce initially, and then in their spare time stripping down the motorbike for their tea. Um, but the, the computational skills that they're using in the accounting office 
uh, they can transfer to you know, working on you know, maximum capacity of their carburetors or what, or, or whatever they, 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 they can only do. I mean, I just, I just want to qualify this because I think like that's a kind of too, too, too crude a picture there. Um, uh, because in a way that sort of, you know, it's interesting what you said and I stopped, like, oh, well, it is true. Well, you know, that, that sort of suggests, right, that, that these, these are got, that, that, that well, because they don't have a science background, particularly uh, evident interest in science, that they are hostile. So they're not, they're not. And I think that's, church that's church where, church that's where, no, church, certainly. I mean, and, uh, and, um, and that's where I think, mean, you know, Barnes was mistaken. Um, uh, because um, all sorts of initiatives are taking place. Um, and you can look at individuals like Augustine Bill and you say to them, well, okay, you're spending all the time running, looking at, at, um, at, at, um, uh, at uh, look, look, running lines. But I mean, you're a pretty bright bloke. You know, what do you think about what we're doing over here? Right now? I mean, it's a splendid. He doesn't turn around and, and adopt a sort of blimpish, uh, blimpish idea. And as I say, Churchill is absolutely crucial. Um, well, uh, I don't know very much about this, so I'm not going to bullshit. Um, I mean, there's, 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 but there's a gentleman here who does. <laughs> I'm just saying, I think it was in the title, I think that was what you were talking about. Uh, well, okay. Okay, wind tunnels do, do uh, actually, what, I put that in there for the alliteration. Um, wind, wind tunnels do date from, from the, uh, uh, from the um, uh, First World War, they expanded dramatically in the Second World in, in, in the interwar period. As you see, man, uh, individual manufacturers um, uh, begin to develop their, to develop their own uh, plant as opposed to relying on so, yeah, the, the, the technology is there in the First World War, but the takeoff is between the wars. The, the wind tunnels, so well, I'm you, happy sorry, to be corrected on this. Point of, uh, the, the Wright brothers used wind tunnels. Yes. Yeah. Um, they built a box, uh, they were bicycle yeah. engineers, of course, among other yeah. things, and, and uh, they had built a, a power driven. Well, yeah, I'm talking about more sophisticated stuff. Than, well, I suppose well, that they that were pushing an open door because right. no one yeah. had done so previously. Yeah. Cayley had played around with whirling. Models, but of course, that, that, and that was quite instructive. It was like an inverse sort of problem you had to build a wind tunnel. Yeah. David has a question. I was really touched to, to, to endorse your point that not having a degree in science has made it all start science, which is, which is the myth, actually. Yeah. Um, and, and a key additional example, Lynn, is, uh, is Prime Minister uh, Arthur Balfour, uh, yeah. Yeah. Who, who, who writes about, about philosophy and, uh, and science, goes on to be first in Europe during, during the war, uh, he's chairman of the MRC. And one, we, we both managed to get in references to Wittgenstein, the Ray Monk is, is here, <laughs> but, but, but we, uh, we won't want to think to get, for the sake of the argument, to get references into uh, Lord Rayleigh, who illustrates your, your, your point about physics uh, uh, perfectly. And Rayleigh is, is the first chairman of the Advisory Committee on Aeronautics. Uh, he's, he's chairman of the Explosives Committee, which, uh, which leads to the, um, uh, the research department Uh, and is a central figure it was in that kind of fluid mechanically oriented physics, if I put it that way, um, that, that is so central uh, to, 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 to aviation. I think it's not too strong to say that if you want to understand the relationship of the British state to uh, technical knowledge, you shouldn't start with the discipline of physics or, or, or chemistry, but, but aviation. You see all these things coming, coming together. Uh, just following on that point, I think a very vivid illustration is um, the description in Graham Farmer's book about Churchill's form of the relationship between Churchill and H.G. Wells, in the extent which Churchill was very much briefed on science and its potential as early as 1900. Yeah. Terry was obsessed with H.G. Wells, um, and uh, I don't know if I was just writing about this the other day, but he, uh, um, he, he bumped into him at Carlton Grill. It's late 1927, um, uh, and uh, you, you sort of get the impression from A, Ferry's letter to Wells, and B, Wells' letter back from the south of France, that um, it was a sort of painful moment where, you know, the great admirers of Tubby Gushy, very out of character for Ferry, 
and Wells can't like to get away really and then you know, gets the predictable invitation you must come and you know and see me and this that and the other uh, I'm terribly busy but I'll check in my diary the same okay one more question I think you had your hand up first sorry. yeah yeah the gentleman next yeah. yeah. Why do you suppose that despite all the uh, obvious achievements of engineers and physicists in the First World War, uh, that the status of engineers in society, professional engineers, has been a constant uh, point of contention, even the past thing? Gosh, that's, that's such a huge question. <laughs> uh, um, I'm tempted to throw that back at you. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, no, that's just that's that's a you know, that, that seems to me that's exactly the sort of thing we should be discussing. Right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well on that on that note, uh, speaking of lunch, <laughs> uh, that's, one of my students, I just I mistakenly um, said that he was studying engineer uh, and studying science, and he was most indignant and absolutely furious at me and said there is no way I'm studying natural sciences. I'm an engineer. So it can work the other way as well. <laughs> so uh, I'd like to thank Adrian and our other two speakers, but don't all rush away because there is another announcement coming. So first of all, we'll thank Adrian and the two speakers.